Dan, what's your reaction? To <laughs> not, not just the, the question, yeah. but your experience. Well, I, I think Ray is right about uh, much of what he said, and, and I want to underline some of it. Uh, many of the world's institutions evolved at a time when you could, in effect, rely on the ignorance of the people that were going to be involved. Uh, religions, for instance. And now, religions are going to change more in the next 20 years than they changed in the last 100 years, and they change more in the last 100 years than they changed in the last 1,000, 2,000 years. And they're going to change more. They're going to change or they're going to go extinct. And they're going to have to change because for the first time they have to deal with the fact that their flocks, their, their, the people that are, are uh, uh, members of those religions, are going to have tremendous access to information about their religion and others. They're going to know what other people think. They're going to know also more. It's just going to be a, anything they want to know about, about their religion is just as available as anything they want to know about the weather or about the, you know, the stock market in Hong Kong. And short of imprisoning people, you're going to have to deal with the fact that they're going to have this knowledge. It's just the transparency this creates is, on the one hand, extraordinarily powerful. We saw it in the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. And although some people, like Bashar al-Assad, thinks that he can continue the old ways, it's pretty clear he can't. Mm -hmm. And he just hasn't. He, sooner or later, he'll realize. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and, and that will be the end of that kind of, of government. Mm. What it will be replaced with is an interesting question, but it, you, you can't go on that way. I think this uh, democratization and transparency, this incredible transparency and, and uh, the, the low cost of information, I think with Ray that this is uh, it's a reality and it's going to go on. I do think there are some negative sides to it, which are uh, very important to discuss. I think that um, the privacy and security are two areas where this transparency is uh, uh, really a threat. Um, we now, just with credit cards already, we leave a trail of breadcrumbs through our lives that are available to anybody to follow. Think about paper money. A feature of paper money, which was not obvious 20 years ago, but very obvious now, is its anonymity. You can go into a store and you can buy something with paper money, and after you've walked out of the store and walked away, sort of nobody knows whether you bought it or not. And you, you, uh, it's an anonymous, it can be an anonymous transaction. Unless you're on the video cam. <laughs> Unless you're on the video cam, yeah. But notice that now it's getting to the point where the only people who use paper money a lot are criminals. And they use it because they need to keep their, their business as secret as possible. And uh, this tells us something uh, important about the inroads in the privacy of transactions and so forth that we're now facing. And whether you think, well, <laughs> I don't care that criminals are having a hard time uh, doing business. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but there are people who earn a good living, criminal people, who earn a good living day in and day out going around with huge suitcases full of cash, depositing that cash in bank accounts and under the $10,000 limit. And they can't, they can't do it fast enough. They, they end up throwing away you know, suitcases full of cash mm -hmm. because they can't, they can't do it. They can't convert it to, to the form where it's usable. That's just one example of the sort of uh, intrusion into aspects of our lives that uh, we might not entirely welcome. I think there's others, but we'll get to those. All right. Yeah, lovely. Tan. Uh, well, just to pick up on a few points that Ray mentioned around the acceleration of technologies around us. I mean, the last few decades, we've really been influenced predominantly by the internet and the web. And those have been very impactful because by their very nature and design, 
um, they foster innovation. You know, the internet, its um, core central value proposition is in the fact that it's open. It's a platform for open participation uh, and, and allows people to connect. Uh, si similarly with the web, it's a, an environment where anyone can share information anywhere in the world, uh, whether you're working collaboratively together or whether you're working independently, there's a centralized place where you can have this access to information. And uh, as an innovator as, and also as an entrepreneur, I mean, one of the things that has, has become very obvious to me is that for any real advancement to take hold in our society, it really requires some form of democratization of the underlying technologies. Um, and this is what innovation has fueled in our, our societies today. This innovation has allowed us, as Ray talked about, I mean, the fact that our cell phones are so much more powerful and because they're so much cheaper, uh, it's a force that's enabled the rest of the population in the world to catch up. And so whilst there is still a disparity between the haves and the have-nots, the overall life, quality of life for people is generally on the increase, and that's a very positive thing. And so how do we um, ensure that when we think about innovation and we ask the questions about what can we use innovation to achieve, uh, those questions need to take into account who we are as people and what we're trying to ascribe to as a society, whether that be economic transformation, whether that be social change, uh, all of these things needs to be taken into account in light of our human values. And I think that's really to the core of your question uh, about transparency. How do we use these? These are tools that we have at our disposal, but how do we uh, really embody in those tool sets um, the spirit and the, the, the aspirations that we all hold in common as human beings? What interests me is, uh, I'll pass to you in a minute, Narelle. Yeah, uh, one more question. It's a framing question, really, because building on what the three of you have said, if we stand back and look at what's happening in the world at the moment, we now have just hit 7 million people on the planet. When I was born, there were under 2 billion people. The 6 billionth child is only 12 years old. So, we're, I mean, it's really increasing exponentially. The, the behavior that we have we're in, a, in a world where if we all want to live like you do in the States, we can perhaps, uh, you know, the, the base load for, for the planet is about one and a half billion. If we want to live like an Indian, an average Indian, then we can probably sustain 18 billion. So there's you know, some leeway there. But it's creating enormous pressure on all our systems, food system, water, um, governance, Energy, we know about, we talk about all the time, even the economy. I mean, we see, we glibly talk about the global financial crisis, not realising that there's going to be another one and another one. They're going to get more and more frequent, more uh, intense. I, I yeah. don't agree with any of the things you're saying, but... Well, wait till I finish, OK? Mm -hmm. Wait till I finish. I get to the point. Uh, what, what I'm also saying is these, these are crises that, we're, the crises that we're not connecting necessarily. That the, the kind of blame, that the terrorism, the conflict that we're beginning to see is to some extent the result of this collapse in systems or a failure in systems and that this have, is having a psychological and cultural effect on individuals. In, in this country, there's, a, there's a, a, an amazing divide between young people who are immensely optimistic about the future. I mean incredibly so and, and very technologically literate uh, people. And there are others who have no hope about their future at all and are working in despair. Now, the point I wanted to make, uh, Ray, was given all of that, if it's not true, OK, it's not true. But from my perspective, what is the possibility for everything you're talking about, Dan's talking about, Tanley is working on, to actually arrive at a point where we can inten intentionally evolve, consciously evolve as a society, instead of just react to and feel trapped in uh, something we can't escape from in terms of e uh, technological progress. Well, <clears throat> I would like to comment a little bit on, uh, get around it anyway, to comment on Dan's promise versus peril, which I agree with. Uh, technology is a double-edged sword. Fire cooked our food and kept us warm, but also burned down our villages. So uh, there is promise and peril in all these technologies. Uh, 
in terms of uh, the perspective that we're running out of resources and the seven billion people and so on, we actually have plenty of resources for our biological population, even as it expands slowly. Uh, Larry Page and I were asked by the National Academy of Engineering to do a study on different energy technologies, and we focused on solar because it's on an exponential rise, and I'm interested in exponential technologies. And the reason it's doing that is because we're applying nanotechnology, a form of information technology, to the design of solar panels, and they get, they're coming down very quickly in price. And the total amount of solar energy is doubling every two years. And it's been doing that for 30 years. It didn't start two years ago. And it's only eight doublings away from being 100% of, meeting 100% of our energy needs. And people tend to dismiss things when it's only half a percent, one percent of a solution. They did that with the internet, and they did that with the Genome Project, and they do that now with solar energy. Well, it's a fringe player. Ignoring the exponential rise, it's only eight doublings from meeting 100% of our energy needs. Uh, this was adopted by the National Academy of Engineering. I presented it recently to the Prime Minister of Israel, who actually was in my class at uh, the MIT Sloan School uh, in the 70s. And he said, well, Ray, do we have enough sunlight to do this with, uh, to double eight more times? And I said, yes, we have 10,000 times more than we need. After we double eight more times and are meeting 100% of our energy needs, we'll be using one part in 10,000 of the sunlight. We could put efficient solar farms on 2% of the unused deserts and meet all of our energy needs. So, yes, we are running out of energy if we limit ourselves to these 19th century technologies like fossil fuels. If we look to these emerging uh, technologies, uh, we are actually awash in energy. Same with water. I mean, look around Australia, there's lots of water, but it's not drinkable, but we know how to convert it into drinkable form, particularly if we have inexpensive energy. Uh, I mean, we don't have time to get into all these technologies. There's new food technologies, vertical agriculture, where we can grow pl hydroponic plants and in vitro cloning of meat uh, to create very inexpensive, high-quality food. Uh, it's Singularity University, which was mentioned, where we have a project to print out uh, modules that you snap together, Lego style, to create very high quality but low cost housing for the developing world. Ultimately, that'll be very inexpensive. Uh, we have these, w with these emerging technologies, we will have environmentally friendly, um, inexpensive uh, resources for, to meet an expanded population.